Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everybody. This lecture has two parts. Can you all hear me? Uh, have I actually really pressed the right button? <laughs> okay, fine. So this lecture has two parts. In the first part, I shall talk about how we humans learn languages independent of teaching arrangements. These observations provide the theoretical framework for my teaching suggestions. First, analysis of natural language acquisition. Second, teaching proposals. Because we can only teach with confidence and clarity if we know how learners learn. That's my firm conviction. So number one, in language use and language learning, meaning is all important. And comprehension is the key to meaning or to learning. We begin to pick up the language when we identify bits of language and their meanings. Obviously, quite obviously, comprehensible input or understandable messages is the necessary condition for language acquisition. But it is not sufficient. Learners will crack the speech code only if they receive input that is comprehended at two levels. They must understand both what is meant, they must understand the messages, and how things are quite literally expressed. That is how the different meaning components work together and are put together to produce the message. This is a principle of double comprehension, and it's the most important single factor in language acquisition according to how I think about it. In many cases, two, both types of understanding can be conflated into one process. In others, not. Children often get the meaning first before they understand the wording in detail. They initially acquire utterances, utterance holes, äußerungs ganze, utterance holes, fixed formulas, or also called routines which must be carved up until all their constituents and content elements can be used freely. This learning process has been graphically demonstrated by Lily Wong Fillmore, who observed five Mexican immigrant children in a Californian primary school on the playground and in their families for a whole school year. Bit by bit, the children began to break down their formulas and perceive a pattern with slots in it, allowing their language to become productive. Let me see it. Okay, here it is. Yes. Let me see it is at first one chunk where my grandchild, Noah, would just say kuchen. Another one is I want it, where Noah simply says haben. Fillmore's children started to break down these expressions into a fixed part, which is underlined here, and a variable part. Let me see it, the Tweedle. Uh, I want it, the scissors. The structures eventually, eventually, eventually became variable in all their slots. Ich, wie heißt du, Fatma, is a German, is, a, is an example from German, is a second language. So children make the passage from formulas or chunks, like let me see it, to let Robert see it, let Manfred or let him do this. You see all the variable parts there now. They begin to understand their internal grammar by extracting the words which they then use to build utterances of their own, of their own. Here are examples of the pattern finding process from L1 acquisition, L1 first language. English children make mistakes such as it's went or it's played. A French example from my grandchild Astor is, is um, tu, tu peux t'aider, tu peux t'aider, du kannst mir helfen, okay. kannst mir helfen. The model for his phrase is probably parental utterances such as attends, je vais t'aider, warte mal, ich werde dir helfen. Yeah? So, uh, for Astor, the verb is initially tede and not ede. He has not separated out verb and pronoun. 
And the German example is Wenn du kommst. Uh, I remember my, my own child. I remember my own child you, you saying that. The force behind this are phrases like Wenn's geht, Wenn's regnet, etc. But what about Zerlaubstus? This is a real puzzle. And I want you to think a little bit about it. Clara and William Stern, who actually wrote the first book-length study on the acquisition of German as a mother tongue at the beginning of the last century, century, noted this example down, and they suggest that the phrase comes from an incomplete analysis of Papa hat's erlaubt and Mama hat's erlaubt. I hope you'll never forget it. Children have to solve numerous riddles on their way to grammar. So let us keep our sense of wonder alive. Language acquisition is not an easy thing. It's not just child's play. It's a miracle deeply embedded in our genes, but a miracle which we slowly begin to understand. Incidentally, at this particular point in their first language acquisition, parents help their children in various ways. Here are two ways you're all familiar with. At the beginning, parents tend to avoid, or some parents tend to avoid personal pronouns, such as, and they say, now Mary has got the ball, now Mama has got the ball, uh, you see, or Mommy has got the ball, instead of saying you and I. Why? Because Mary and Mommy are quite unambiguous, whereas the pronouns change the reference and are more difficult to grasp. And, of course, parents ask a lot of didactical questions, such as, what's mommy's name, what's your little sister's name, etc. Caregivers give the child very finely tuned feedback. They restructure their own language so that many parental utterances can be seen as mapping aids as well as segmentation aids that separate out isolate and identify certain meaningful constituents and thus ease their children's way into language. They make them hear the words so that they stand out clearly in some cases, not always. Which n uh, words which normally run together and blend together in a, in a continuous stream. Mama kommt gleich. That's a continuous stream, isn't it? All learners, all learners, not just children in natural acquisition situations, have problems in sorting out individual words and their distinct meanings, as we can see in the following example. A child learning English in kindergarten produced a sentence, I need three apples, please. He must have thought that an apple was actually a apple. Actually, the same kind of error was made centuries earlier when along with the fruit, the word naranja was imported into England and wrongly understood as an aranja, which became an orange. Analysis stopped halfway. Similarly, classroom learners must break down utterances from their constituent parts in order to be able to recombine these parts meaningfully. French beginners usually taught, are usually taught the phrase Je m'appelle Christophe. And what Germans usually understand, and my uh, the little girl of my neighborhood understood and came to me and asked me, what about this? I, 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 I have difficulties with French. In their first week of French, of course, uh, is Ich heiße Christophe which becomes a puzzle when they see it printed. So they should also know that the French actually say Ich mich nenne, or Ich mich rufe, Christoph. Again, double comprehension is needed. But puzzling this out costs mental resources, or a neighbor who knows what I mean. So why not clarify it right away by mirroring the phrase in German as I just did? By mirroring the phrase in German as I just did. Sorry, I should have showed you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Burmeister reports that some children in a bilingual kindergarten thought that get your cups 
meant think was, which clearly shows that understanding messages, comprehensible input, the formula that went around the world and was wrong, understanding messages is only half the battle. No? Uh, understanding messages, getting the idea, getting the intention, think was, uh, is only half the battle. So learners need help here and we've seen that patterns that uh, we've seen that parents do help children to understand and tease apart, auftrennen, tease apart language patterns with just one way of scaffolding, abstützen, scaffolding their learning processes. Teachers, for their part, can use mother tongue mirroring to scaffold foreign language learning. Mirroring the foreign construction in the native language is a natural strategy. I remember an Australian boy who told me, in English we say half past twelve, in German it's ha half to one, but they leave out the two and just say half one, half eins. Hmm. Okay. And I remember a boy in, a, in an international school in Geneva who said, en allemand on dit le petit, le petit bleu poisson, hmm? whereas the French say le petit poisson bleu, the kleine of fish blauer. So this is mirroring the foreign construction in the native language, and he did it himself. A Korean student of mine wrote a strategy which I had chosen to learn a difficult structure was to compare it to Korean and then memorize a very simple sentence for illustration, for instance, what a, bo what a good boy you are, where English word order is quite different from Korean. So, I insist on the fact that mirroring is a, is a natural strategy. In the next example, a pupil remembers, oh, I had, ah, yes, okay, this is now it. I'm not talking about this here. A pupil remembers a typical misunderstanding. Our teacher often demand, demanded silence with the expression, be quiet. To me, to me, this was one word, and I was absolutely proud when someday I learned that the word quiet, I learned the word quiet and discovered its meaning. Although I had sensed what her ex meant to say, I could then correct the pronunciation in my mind because I had identified the isolated words. So only from then on are sentences like, you know, be quiet, be nice, be kind, uh, within her reach. Or take the phrase, see you tomorrow. German beginners who don't see the phrase printed, who don't see the phrase printed, remember the printed word, the printed sentence is already a grammatical analysis, isn't it? That's why we call it grammar. Huh? Okay who don't see it printed, German beginners who don't see it printed, automatically assume this means bis morgen, which is, limit, which is uh, well, literally until tomorrow. With this half analysis, they can produce time phrases such as see you later, see you next week, see you on Monday. Okay, they can do that now. But it will prevent them from producing location phrases like see you at the gym, see you at the bus stop. Only a full analysis of the phrase, such as provided by mother tongue mirroring, Seh euch morgen, will do the job. Double comprehension is both necessary and sufficient. Let's change perspectives. Think of an English tourist, tourist who asks you, how do you say what's the time in German? You tell him, just say, wie spät ist es? This works well from a communicative point of view. It's the perfect equivalent, although not the only one. However, it's good enough for tourists only. Language learners need to know more. Okay. Language learners need to know more. In this case, they need to, learners, they need to know that what, the, what Germans actually say is, how late is it? That's what the Germans say literally, which gives the anatomy of the phrase plus the logic behind it. Yeah. 
That way the German time phrase could become, could become a recipe for many more sentences, wie spät ist es, wie alt ist es, wie lang ist es, wie teuer ist es, etc., etc. So the learning process, uh, they start learning this phrase. And now this example from Turkish. Teşekkür ederim in Turkish means thank you. You've understood the message. As I've just said, this is a necessary condition for language learning, for acquisition, because you can now use the phrase yourself. But a formal, analytic understanding that will take you much further, thanks I make, or even better, genau gespiegelt in German, thanks make I. Because I, the personal pronoun, is expressed by the ending im. This kind of explanation, which I've called mother tongue mirroring, is an elegant, plausible, and highly satisfying way of clarifying foreign constructions. And yet, it is conspicuously absent in our course books. Although it is easily understood and will eventually help students to build more sentences along the same lines. They can analogize, improvise, and risk sentences they've never heard before, which is the essence of language learning. That's the point, the crux of the, mat of the matter. Tong Wu reports, a Chinese friend of mine, young friend of mine, when we were in China, I saw that double comprehension can indeed make a difference in, in a learner's foreign language production. In those cases where my German friend only knew what a Chinese utterance meant, he could hardly be creative in terms of making new combinations out of what he's just understood. In contrast, when he knew not only what it meant, but also how it was constructed, he could easily create new expressions of his own to fit into different situations. And precisely, and that's precisely what children do. They want to say their own things. They actually take risks and sometimes go too far. So they produce their well-known overextensions or overgeneralizations. Uh, they say hocher instead of höher, they fehler und die fielsten, or they use wrong plurals like the omnibusen, the anoraken, or plural s is overgeneralized or overextended, like onkels and apfels. And I remember quite recently my grandchild, uh, Lina, who used uh, participles such as aufgehebt, angezieht, ausgesteigt, and she fully communicated fully, of course, with these wrong participles. Uh, English examples are wrong plurals like mouses and foots, or past tense like uh, sticked, bringed, put it, hit it, etc. pp. All these forms, they can't have retrieved, preformed from their memory. They show that they are well on their way to grammar, even if they overshoot in these cases. Peter, between two and three years old, also produces his own forms which he, in, which, with which he communicates successfully. Das zu dran machen, ne? das zu schmeißen, das zu bouillon rein tun, das zu Eier, Eier rausnehmen, etc., etc. Very useful if you don't remember the names of things. And similarly, my grandchild Olivia, who grows up trilingually in France, uses a mixed French-German sentence pattern which she can't have heard before. She can't have heard because she was the only child at the time. She can't have heard that from anybody else here in where she lived. Vö runter, vö haus, vö anziehen, vö kuk, vö ilse. She wants to talk to her aunt on the phone. And that was that was all. I collected this in, uh, at Christmas in 2008. Language acquisition, and this is what follows from all these examples, which I have multiplied for you, that you so you can fully understand. Now, language acquisition is innovative and creative. It is not the acquisition of a growing repertoire of ready-made phrases or formulas with which tourists try to operate. Children not only imitate, initially this is all they do, imitation, initially. Uh, 
Uh, but then they go beyond what they've heard. They go beyond what they've heard. They generate language, and through language, new ideas. This happens all the time, but we can only be sure that they don't just reproduce what they've heard. If they produce unconventional and ungrammatical language, then we know for sure, well, they, she can't have heard this, or maybe heard it from other children, of course. Yeah. One last point before we come to teaching techniques. Children sort of practice or play with sentence patterns in non-communicative situations, situations such as pre-sleep monologue, pre-sleep monologues. Witness the kind of unsolicited verbal play that Ruth Weir recorded when her son was left alone in the dark before he went to sleep what color, what color blanket, what color map, what color glass, etc. And here's a monologue from my own child. Papa pomped, mama pomped, auto pomped, etc., etc. Pomped, in this case, means compt, of course. And as I've just pointed out, playing with language is not manipulating syntax, really. It's, it's playing with ideas. As Natasha shows us, who explores the counterfactual, eh? pointing, eh? pointing to her nose, this is my foot, pointing to her eyes, this is my nose, etc., etc., this is my eyes, this is my neck, this is my head, this is my wrist, uh, and ends up with gurgles of amusement. Uh, uh, exploiting the counterfactual, pointing to something and saying the other thing. Yeah? Let me conclu conclude this part by insisting that only with double comprehension, uh, insisting only with double comprehension, we can learners bring the basic, exclusive human property of language into play. Right. Now you must really pay attention carefully when I say, when uh, when I say the basic, the basic human and exclusively human property of language into play. It's combinatorial power. It's the core pro property of language, according to Chomsky. The core capacity, which in our teaching methodology is referred to as the generative principle. But you won't find it in, in lots of books on teaching. In Humboldt's famous words, we can make infinite use of finite means. Denn sie, in Klammern die Sprache, steht ganz eigentlich einem unendlichen und wahrhaft grenzenlosen Gebiete dem Inbegriff alles Denkbaren gegenüber. Sie muss daher von endlichen Mitteln einen unendlichen Gebrauch machen und vermag dies durch die Identität der Gedanken und Sprache erzeugenden Kraft. Ich hoffe, dass Sie das dann, wenn ich weitermache, auch noch voll und ganz verstehen, diese wichtige, dieses wichtige, diese wichtige Idee. Because notice the two aspects of the combinatorial power of language. The inexhaustibility of what is sayable and thinkable. By manipulating the building blocks of language, we produce new thoughts. Language is not just for communication. It's for thinking as well as for communication. It's our thought organ. This trick, so to speak, of combining and recombining accounts for the vast expressive power of language. Is grammar the motor of thought? Does grammar make us smarter than all the other beings on earth? Question mark. End of part one. Now we've got a one or two minutes to exchange your notes with people sitting next to you, ask each, each other questions and clarify your ideas. Okay, I'll make it just a pause of one or two minutes. So talk to your neighbors about what remained unclear. Well, I apologize for not taking your questions now. I would like to uh, present my second part first, and hopefully there will be time for your questions after that. So what follows from all this for teaching? What shall we do as teachers? The sentences, pupils encounter 
in their basic texts, such as dialogue, stories, or songs, must not remain encapsulated in those texts, but must be varied and become, and become productive sentence patterns. For instance, the line, what shall we do with a drunken sailor, uh, from, the sea from the sea shanty, what shall we do with a drunken sailor, um, that is, the shall I or shall we construction must not remain enshrined in the well-known sea shanty, but must be available for other ideas such as um, what shall I do with my back, it hurts so much, or what shall I do with my hair, that's what, you know, from lots of girls are, uh, are sp may, may be saying this sort of thing, uh, or what shall we do with our math teacher, <laughs> he sets us too much homework, uh, what shall I do with my wife, what shall I do with my life? We have thus opened up completely new dimensions and are miles away from drunken sailors. <laughs> In other words, a sentence that is well practiced because it comes from such a text, a sentence must become a recipe, ein Rezept, a recipe for many more sentences, a germ cell for numerous other sentences. But watch out. Sentence variations must be experienced as sense variations. Die Sprache erzeugende, aber auch im, identisch mit der Gedanken erzeugenden Kraft. Ne? Sentence variations must be experienced as sense variations, not just as syntactical manipulations, as Humboldt reminds us. We may safely assume that children who permutate sentences even in non-communicative situations are interested in the novel ideas which they generate and not in syntax. Okay, well, now for teaching. The problem is that pattern recognition recognizing how this works, this construction, pattern recognition. Our instinct, in our innate instinct for analogy comes only into play after a fair amount of linguistic material has been learned. That's what we know from studies of first language acquisition. Uh, we know that children need, mass need and get massive input and it takes some time for them to break down these utterances and, uh, and, and recognize what the patterns are. So as teachers of three hours per week learners, three HPW learners, we don't receive the massive language contacts of natural learners and we cannot simply rely on the pattern finding skills of children. This would be a sort of naturalistic fallacy, der naturmethodische Trugschluss, a naturalistic fallacy. Yeah? Just make yourself understood, yeah, and leave them alone with the language. And, they'll, and finally the, and the, and the pennies will drop. Yeah? That's the naturalistic fa fallacy. No, we must find the right methodology to accelerate the learning process. That is, we must shorten the process of pattern recognition, and we must practice a construction so that it can take root and learners feel encouraged, they feel encouraged to risk something new on the analogy of what is familiar. The, solu the solution I propose are semi-communicative bilingual pattern builds, halb kommunikative bilinguale Strukturübungen. They ought to be a cornerstone in our language methodology. And I shall spend the rest of the this lecture to show how they work in practice. Now, first of all, how do you proceed? You select a sentence that can be easily turned into a productive pattern from a basic text that has been studied carefully. It could be, again, it could be a song, a story, or, or a dialogue. The sentences are thus anchored in well understood situations but must now be freed from this embeddedness in the specific situational and linguistic context. Here are two dialogues performed by my primary school children who I teach once a week in the last lesson of the day. 
Oh, you've seen that one dialogue. Let me see. Uh, enjoy this. Ask questions. Great sentences. Say it in English. You know I English. Oh, come on! Let's sing a song! Let's act on the dialogue. English is cool. English is fantastic. English is about my everyday work. Oh, yeah. 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 the dialogue they made a rap out of it they quite by themselves you see uh, they made it actually okay yes and here's another one the black eye ske sketch you see uh, this has got um, uh, this is based on a really on a real event that is I once came into the classroom with a bloodshot eye and was immediately greeted by one of the girls Herr Putzkamp was is passiert and then I wrote this dialogue, which is linguistically quite demanding for uh, primary school children. But they could, yeah, they could do it. They can do it. Let's see. Here it is. And let's see, immediately see. Um. I must say, in this group, there were four, four girls who were good singers. See, so I, I risked doing yesterday with them. <laughs> uh, and they could do it. My, my present group can't really do it that, 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 that well. But they actually could keep a tune. Great. Well, yes, um, and now take another one. And here again, I have to, yeah. This is for pure amusement and enjoyment, of course. Wrong word. Timmy, will you make me a sandwich? What? Will you please make me a sandwich? But mothers make sandwiches for their boys, don't they? The times are changing. Up into the kitchen, there's something wrong with this word. Okay. What kind of sandwich do you want? Um, cheese bit. Cheese bit. Okay. And now, you see, after they actually can do this dialogue so well, as they just did, you start this pattern drill with mother tongue cues. Uh, oh, yes, I'll try to show you again. See, um, you begin with easy substitutions and what you should do here you can see now make your own sentences at some point in the during the activity the activity is handed over to the student students and so it becomes monolingual you start out bilingually giving german cues sentence stimulus sentences and then you, over to you, now make your own sentences, okay? And never give too many sentences before because you, you might have used up all the words they need for their own sentences. In the beginning, there are not many words which might fit, in, fit the pattern. Yeah? So, Platz für selber tun lassen. Okay, well, let's see if I can do this here. In this case, I asked two or three uh, children to come to my own place in order to make the recording. So this is not the whole group.
Machst du mir da bitte ein Brot? Will you please make me a sandwich? Machst du mir bitte zwei Brote? Will you make me a sandwich? Will you please make me two sandwiches? You can, you see that, you know, you see what, what, what happened. Um, what is very important, but what's very important for you to know is, um, willst du mal bitte, spielst du mal bitte, the, the last sentence. Wollt ihr mal bitte stille sein? This shows you how effective German sentence cues are because you've got facial expressions, you've got mimes and gestures to support meaning. Wollt ihr mal bitte stille sein? Will you please be quiet? You see? So these are the three things you ought to know. Hand it over to the students at some point when you think they could do it. Don't make too many sentences so they, they can make sentences of their own. They have got new vocabulary which fits in. In this case, it's easy for them to switch from, big, from little sister to big sister. Or use, or will you please help your mother? Will you please help your father? Will you please help your partner? You see, that's, that's quite easy. They will come up with sentences. And they want to come up with their own ideas. Okay? Um, don't, so don't give too many pro prompts and in many, some cases use your voice, minds and gestures to support meaning. Or take another sentence from the same dialogue, you might have, uh, still remember it. Um, Etwas stimmt nicht mit dieser Welt. There's something wrong with this world. That was the dialogue sentences. You know, I always start out with that dialogue sentence. There's a point of departure. Und dann, Etwas stimmt nicht mit meinem Computer. My computer. Uh, so you see how mimes, gestures in, can support meaning here. Uh, some, there's something wrong with my computer. Etwas stimmt nicht mit unserem Lehrer. There's something wrong with our teacher. Etwas stimmt nicht mit ihm. Etwas stimmt nicht mit ihm. There's something wrong with him. Etwas stimmt nicht. Jetzt kommt wieder kommt wieder die kleine Schwester. Etwas stimmt nicht mit meiner kleinen Schwester. Yeah? Uh, so here is another point for you to. Uh, uh, pay attention to. We need to explore the communicative potential or the communicative reach of a given construction. So notice the mental leap from computer to teacher. That is from things to persons. Incidentally, this little leap from things to persons, this mental leap, is a big leap for retarded children. A very big leap for them. And um, uh, it, it seems that intellectually alert pupils make these semantic leaps by themselves and readily change topics, whereas others keep within given domains. So if you start out with food items, they stick with these food items. Or if you, or if you start out with animals, they will stick to animals. And others will venture forth, will risk something and have new ideas. And we've got, actually have got to do this. Uh, with older learners, you could even risk a sentence, there's something wrong with our democracy, couldn't you? Uh, just as an idea for them to think about. Uh, so all learners must learn to generalize, verallgemeinern, across, ver across various domains of experience things and persons as well, if it works well with this construction, of course. And notice a big shift in terms of content in my next example, which is the line, all I want is a room somewhere. Do you remember that line? Where did I take this from? All I want is a room somewhere. The musical My Fair Lady, it's Eliza's song, you see. All I want is a room somewhere. Now, before starting, uh, we make sure the learners understand both the message and the construction, of course. Yeah? Uh, idiomatic German, that's the message. Ich will ja nur ein Zimmer, that's what we actually say. But they should also know that the English say it a little bit differently. Yeah? Alles, was ich will, oh, maybe as a mirrored version, that is ungrammatical German. Alles, ich will, that's what the English say, alles, ich will. 
Yeah? And then we elicit sentence variations from our class. Ich will ja nur eine Tasse Tee, ich will ja nur eine Tasse Kaffee, ich will ja nur ein Glas Milch. Eine einfache, uh, simple substitution at the very beginning. Oh, oh, und ich will ja nur, and now the mental leap, the shift. Ich will, ich will ja nur eine ruhige Klasse. Ja? Ihr wollt ja nur gute Zensuren. Die wollen nur unser Geld. All I want is you, <laughs> I could actually say also. But all you want is love, all you get is video. Yeah. The, you see how you can play around with language and have different ideas. The teacher's idea is to practice the formal device of a contact clause where the relative pronoun is left out. But in the minds of the pupils, these are variations on the theme of wishes and dreams rather than a structure drill. The teacher asks himself how he can show his pupils through interesting substitution possibilities that this construction is suitable for their own needs of expression. His job is to probe the commutative radius of a construction, explore its semantic potential, also die semantische, inhaltliche Reichweite abtasten, abzutasten, versuchen, einer solchen Konstruktion. That is, the exchangeable sentence elements become of greatest importance. The next example is taken from the dialogue Home, Sweet Home. Listen to it first. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm getting used to this thing now. Yeah. The doorbell's ringing. Can you open the door, please? No, I can't. I'm studying the present progressive. <laughs> Betty, what about you? But I'm finding my nails. And I'm baking a cake for you, clowns. <laughs> nice, isn't it? Uh, yes, okay. Now, I'm not going to play this. And this is what I did with... Uh, ich, uh, 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 this is actually a transcript. You can see that there are mistakes. Ich mache einen Kuchen. Ich bin dabei, einen Kuchen zu machen in English. I bake a cake. I'm baking a cake. Repeat. I'm baking a cake. Ich mache gerade eine Pizza. I'm making, vorsagen, I'm making a pizza. Ich mache gerade sandwiches. I'm making sandwiches. And so on. The example shows that repetition and easy substitutions are necessary for the learners to establish the specific sound structure of a construction and get into the rhythm of it. Get into the rhythm of it. Mistakes, no, I'm making, I'm, uh, and the M is, and then we've got the ing form at the end uh, after the verb, with the verb. I'm doing, I'm making, um, get into the rhythm of this construction. Mistakes will be made, but will be ironed out or practiced away through repetition of correct constructions. Part of language learning is habit formation, and this takes several repetitions, perhaps up to a dozen. Repetitions are necessary for a new construction to take roots. Naturally, mother tongue cues don't always succeed. It can happen that the mother tongue words, rather than the idea it expressed, functions as the mental trigger. In other words, a pupil begins to translate constructing an English sentence word for word, analogous to the German wording. We need experience to effectively deal with or forestall interference errors. Most of the time, errors can be prevented through appropriate cueing and sequencing or simply immediate prompts, schlichtes Vorsagen. Aber das klingt dann wahr. Aber ich mache doch gerade meine Hausaufgaben. And then I said, use doing, because I don't want making. So I just say, use doing. And I knew that there was a girl who played the violin. And so I also used that phrase, which made it very relevant for her. Und ich spiele gerade Geige. Aufpassen. I could also raise my finger and say, die Geige. And so I got, I got the correct sentence. And I'm playing the violin. So you, now, you've got to see for yourself how you can deal or, uh, uh, with interference errors and work against the pull of the German spoken phrase. Uh, in traditional monolingual pattern drills, 
a formal problem, a word or word group has to be substituted at the right place. Now, I wonder whether all of you know what traditional monolingual pattern drills are, how they work, uh, because they are no longer very popular. In the 1890s, all the textbooks were full of uh, pattern drills, actually. Um, but, uh, so I give you an example. Huh? Uh, you, any, you, you start out with a basic sentence, like, uh, listen, someone's crying. Huh? And then you give a word, so that you, and, that, and, and you tell the students, you throw out another, uh, throw out a word, you stick to, the, stick to the pattern, throw out one word and put in the correct word, which the word which I give you, making the necessary grammatical exp um, adaptation. So, again, uh, someone's crying to sing. Response, someone's singing, singing. Yeah? Um, speaking, uh, to speak. Or I could say speaking, but I say to speak. Someone speaking, to speak French. Someone speaking French, to speak German, someone speaking German, to whisper, someone's whispering, you see, or maybe think of Natasha with this is my nose. So uh, she takes the phrase, this is my nose, this is uh, for beginners, it's got to be practiced, yes. This is my nose, uh, or the nose, eye, this is my eye, mouth, this is my mouth, chin, this is my chin, watch it, lips, these are my lips. Uh, Okay, so they must make the necessary grammatical arrangements, adaptations, adaptations. This is, this is traditional monolingual pattern drills. They are much more interesting than you, than you might think from these examples, but I'm not, I'm, I don't want to talk about them, I want to talk about the bilingual pattern drills. Um, they run on different mental tracks. You see, in a monolingual pattern drill, you just substitute a word at the right place. You might not even have understood, but you know that you've got to, you know, I've got to put it in the ink form, the, you know, and then put it there where it belongs. That's all you've got to do. So it's a syntactical manipulation. Wh whereas with a bilingual drill, um, you express an idea. Wollt ihr mal bitte stille sein? Within that construction we had, no? Will you please be quiet? Voltima, bitte stille sein. Will you please? You express an idea, as we do in normal speech. Where the idea comes from is, of course, important. So we always switch from teacher's cues to sentences generated by the students themselves. The drill presents or exemplifies constructions instead of describing them and simultaneously reveals their communicative range or radius, the Reichweite again. The rules are, are caught rather than taught and there is no analytical and terminological overkill which is often the case in the teaching of grammar. We can help students to get into the rhythm of a construction and maximize language turnover through pair work. Pair work is great, really. Um, here is a dialogue, head boy and head girl, adapted uh, from the peanuts. Head boy, me? I can't do that. Why not? I'll help you. We'll wait for you. But think of the work. Think of the responsibility. Think of the power. I'll do it. Huh? Okay. Uh, they like this dialogue very much. Um, in this short dialogue, the LL construction occurs three times. I'll help you, we'll vote for you, I'll do it. And so it suggests itself for practice. The teacher starts the drill as usual, but then hands out a worksheet with German-English parallel columns. One partner gets the sheet and acts as the teacher who gives the mother tongue stimulus sentences. Okay, ich mach das dann und, und, and he expects his, his partner to say, okay, I'll do it. So, and whenever his partner hesitates, he will prompt him with the correct answer. So, again, double comprehension again, because before the drill starts, the teacher explains, we say, ich mach's. But the English say it differently, ich werd's machen. So, be, so the pupils notice the contrast. With mother tongue cues, we don't shy away from the contrast. 
we take the bull by the horns, so to speak. And habit formation again. Through repetition and variation, the foreign construction becomes less foreign and begins slowly, begins slowly, begins to sound naturally. To sound naturally. Learners start developing some kind of Ohrgefühl or Bauchgefühl for this particular construction. And that works only through enough repetitions. And children in their natural language acquisition, they get these massive contacts, language contacts, and they've got these lots of repetitions, which, uh, and to some extent, we've got to reproduce this in the classroom, otherwise the language, is, the language of construction won't stick. A Realschullehrer recently pointed out to me that good pupils could be trusted to write these exercises themselves once the teacher has started with them, you see, to end as a homework and practice with the class and be the teacher. And I think this is a classical example of the idea learning by teaching, lernen durch lehren. So with this activity, learners can experience a sort of language explosion because the number of sentences made available to them is rapidly increasing and chances are, chances are that the learners could eventually, eventually use some of these sentences for personal communication. I also suspect that bilingual learners are particularly useful if we, bring, if we can bring the foreign language and the mother tongue into sharp contrast. Ne? Also, wie lange machst du das schon? How long have you been doing? Learners must make the equation. Wie lange? Wie lange? Wie lange schon? Ne? Is equated with the, with the English uh, Present perfect progressive, that's it, isn't it? With the English present perfect progressive. Wie lange machst du das schon? But we need a number of repetitions of this in a very short time, and you get them if you make an exercise, do an exercise like that. Well, um, or maybe recently somebody told me, yeah, I, in a Grundkurs or a Klasse 10, or, um, I had to practice uh, or three times in a row. Different people used uh, want with that phrase. I want that. Yeah? Ich möchte das. Well, then, and then I started to, to uh, and with a little uh, bilingual uh, pattern drill uh, in order for them to develop this Urgefühl. Yeah? Ich möchte das has to be associated with I want you to do with the infinitive. And this takes some repetitions for them. So they get into to the, the rhythm of this, uh, of this particular construction. But the crowning glory of bilingual pattern drills is when the teacher succeeds in giving sentences, that is, ideas, that relate to the problems of the day. In other words, when he can personalize, individualize, or localize his sentence cues. Here's an example from a grammar school, second year English, where the teacher alludes to an impending general election in Germany in, in, in 2005, Schröder versus Merkel. The class had been practicing, somebody needs some, some, somebody or something. So uh, Angie braucht Hilfe. Sie braucht Hilfe von, Freund, von ihren Freunden. Angie braucht Hilfe von den Wählern. Well, say voters. Direkt vorsagen, weil das Wort nicht bekannt because the word was probably not well known. Sie braucht Hilfe von ihren Wählern. Herr Schröder braucht auch Wähler. Sie alle brauchen unsere Stimmen. Say votes. Yeah. And of course you could, you could end up with jeder braucht einen zum Liebhaben. Everybody, everybody needs somebody to love. But uh, um, it's a pity I didn't remember the phrase at the time. So this uh, didn't end, I didn't end up, we didn't end up with that phrase. This distinct, distinct focus on meaning would be impossible without L1 cues. And this distinct focus on meaning is impossible for the, the writer of course books, for you, to give it to you. Because you've got to do it as a teacher yourself, because only you've got the situation, uh, federal election, for example, or other situations. So you've got to adapt, make your own, to, to some extent, you've got to uh, create your own exercises. Yeah? 
And it also shows you this distinct focus on meaning could, would be impossible without L1Qs, which shows that the controversy about the use or non-use of the mother tongue, of the student's native language, is not to be solved with the banal advice that you should use it judiciously. Yeah? That's very banal, trivial. Okay, what are the results? Admittedly, a drill series cannot focus on meaning in its full force because here language is not used in social encounters. So never have pattern drills been meant to replace truly, truly communicative activities. But can they prepare for them? <coughs> yes, they can. The stage is set for a bit of real communication when the students are asked to make up their own sentences. When they do this, most of them are not performing language operations in a void. Some students may play it safe, some may play it safe, and give easy examples. But others will feel tempted to vie with the teacher, with dem Lehrer so ein bisschen wetteifern, take risks and produce loaded sentences. Be that as it may, the teacher can always ask a pupil, is that if a pupil comes up with one, or with one of his or her sentences, is that sentence true for you? Or he can jump in directly, like the teacher in the following example. The class is practicing the present continuous and a pupil comes up with this sentence. My sister is doing a test in class 9b. And so, huh? And then the teacher comes, in, comes up with, uh, and uh, he breaks out of, steps out of the practice. Is your sister a pupil of this school? Yes, she is. What test is she sitting? A math test. So she's sitting a math test right now. I hate math. Do you like math? And then that was the end probably of this um, little interlude. Um, um, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't, I don't like to say I hate math. We shouldn't actually, uh, uh, um, disencourage students from actually doing what they've got to do, yeah? I uh, would have... But anyhow, you do that. You, it's kind of a provocation, of course. So the teacher can always step out of grammar, pra grammar practice. He can do as if, you see, as if principle, as if the pupil meant it seriously and can thus build small communicative islands in a sea of language practice. Now here is a very old example which I published in my Psycholinguistik, the Fremdsprachenunterricht in 1989. Very old example. I've got to mention this because this is a class in their very first year of English in a secondary modern school in a Hauptschule. And now, of course, uh, uh, we've got English starts in primary school, but at that, at that time, at that time, uh, English, was, English started in, uh, in secondary schools only. So the teacher takes a sentence, I've got a good idea, first year English, Hauptschule, I've got a good idea from a previously introduced dialogue and starts with a bilingual pattern drill. Ich habe einen fantastischen Einfall. I've got a fantastic idea. Wir haben eine wunderbare Idee. We've got a wonderful idea. Er hat immer gute Ideen. He's always got good ideas. Um, ich habe eine grüne Idee. I've got a green idea. Ich habe eine blaue Idee. I've got a blue idea. You see, his pupils had only a few adjectives available at the time, available for substitutions here. And the teacher therefore makes a virtue out of necessity by presenting these comical sentences, just one of the means of shifting, shifting the focus from form onto sense, because there is sense in nonsense, uh, isn't there? Eventually, he produces a loaded sentence and breaks out of the drill with a quick question. Teacher, ich habe einen dummen Lehrer. Okay, Jenny, I've got a silly teacher. Have you got a silly teacher? Yes. Uh, who would, you, uh, would you be so kind as to tell me his name? Mr. Morrison. Ha, ha, ha. Oh. You're laughing, huh? So naturally, the teacher receives an immediate answer which he was in fact, in fact expecting. He himself is called Mr. Morrison in his English lessons. Admittedly, this is a very brief, very brief communicative exchange. 
But we all start small, don't we? As a final step, the class can be instructed to write their own dialogues in groups. Uh, to write their own dialogues in groups, to change basic dialogues by using the sentence variations just practiced. Remember the dialogue, home, sweet homes, doorbells ringing? Yeah? And here is a dialogue written by pupils, and based on that dialogue, the doorbells ringing, and sent to me by someone who was then a trainee teacher with Marco Hoppe. I think this, I so, I'm so grateful that she gave me this feedback. The doorbell's ringing. Can you open the door? No, I can't. I'm eating a dinner. What about you, Herbert? I can't. I'm having diarrhea. <laughs> uh, that is, she said the week before she had introduced the word diarrhea because there, someone had a problem of this kind. Okay. And another dialogue started out like this. The dog's belling. Can you take it out for a walk? Well, learners need to take risks. So they did take risks here and said the dog's belling and the teacher couldn't get round to all the groups and correcting it, uh, correct it at the time. Huh? I don't know. Well, thank you ever so much. What, what was her name, Karina? Okay, thank you very much, Marco and Karina, for giving me this feedback. Here is another example of a, of a dialogue written and performed by my pupils in the 1980s. Uh, but first, the original Peanuts dialogue. Lucy, what's going on here? Charlie Brown, I'm helping Snoopy to bury a bone. Good grief. Can't he do that himself? Charlie Brown, he hates getting his hands dirty. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, pupils' dialogue. The teacher enters the classroom. What's going on here? We are playing football. Sorry, but who's playing football? Peggy, Mary, Betty, Anne, and I. Girls playing football? What are the boys doing? They are playing with dolls. Good grief. Good grief. Now, this is what you can get from students, of course. And at the time, in the 1980s, uh, girls playing football wasn't that much popular. I mean, it has become much more accepted now. Huh? So maybe, uh, yeah, OK, fine. Well, and after a group presents their play, there is an opportunity for the class to ask questions, to comment on the play, and even suggest how to improve it. The teacher helps to clarify what was perhaps unclear. This allows for some spontaneous message-oriented communication, which is ultimately what we need. Spontaneous, real, or as I say, message-oriented communication. Yeah? Uh, Mitteilungsbezogene Kommunikation versus Sprachbezogene Kommunikation. Message-oriented communication where you actually mean what you want to say, what you say. They really mean it. Because we all know, as we all know, we learn how to communicate by communicating. But we are getting the results when we prepare our learners for this, for this very important message-oriented communication. In my language teaching philosophy, the generative principle, the generative principle, which is mentioned in some methodology books, but not in many, the generative principle, which targets at the productive capacity, the productive power inherent in language and puts it to use, is as important, as important as the communicative principle. Sadly, it has been grossly neglected in mainstream thinking. Teachers can harness, harness these natural skills with semi-communicative pattern drills, as I've just shown. The drills proposed are grammar at work, grammar in, in action. Yes, walk the walk from drill to communication and self-expression. Here's an example of pattern practice which my pupils made meaningful and enjoyable through intonation, mimes, and gestures. 
I taught these phrases bilingual fir bilingually first, but now they no longer need the German. Okay. You re Nobody remember her, don't you? Everybody talks to me. Nobody talks to me. Everybody listens to me. Nobody listens to me. Everybody plays with me. Nobody plays with me. Everybody asks me. Nobody asks me. Everybody writes me. Nobody writes me. Everybody helps me. Nobody helps me. Everybody likes me. Nobody likes me. Everybody understands me. Nobody understands me. Everybody remembers me. Nobody remembers me. Everybody knows me. Yes, at the end. <laughs> yes, at the end. Okay. Uh, have we got the next one as well? No. The, um. Nobody wants me. Everybody wants me. Nobody <laughs> talks to me. Everybody talks to me. Nobody listens to me. Everybody listens to me. Nobody plays with me. Everybody plays with me. Nobody asks me. Everybody asks me. Nobody writes me. Everybody writes me. Nobody likes me. Everybody likes me. Nobody helps me. Everybody helps me. Nobody understands me. Everybody understands me. Nobody thinks of me. Everybody thinks of me. So he's got enough of it now. See, see how clever they are. They, uh, he just has the sheet in front of him on the, on, on the floor, you see. So whenever uh, he doesn't know how it goes on, he just have a, has a quick look. Huh? And the, uh, you remember the remember the dialogue, uh, the black eye sketch, where uh, the girl had the text on the table, uh, because these these are little things, but they are important because the students want to perform well, they don't want to get stuck, yeah? and so uh, they but they should use their hands and gestures, so this is a little thing for them, and they find how they can do it with these little things. Okay. Well, my conclusion, Carl Sagan said, when you are in love, you want to tell the world. Yes, and when you really have a message, you also want to tell the world. And I feel I have a message to put across because what I've just told you is far from the mainstream. Uh, and yet I feel passionately about it. And that's why I'm grateful to have this opportunity here. Thank you again uh, for inviting me to the Loifana. With regard to mother tongue use in the classroom, John Caldwell, Guy Cook and others think that the way is open for a major paradigm shift in language teaching. So let us do away with a mother tongue taboo which is only self-crippling. You won't find these exercises in your textbook. And I think this is self-crippling. And actually, 2,000 years of successful language teaching has been thrown into the dustbin with the mother tongue taboo. Foreign language teaching must be based on a new foundation, the pupil's native language. Millions of average language learners in average schools and taught on average for three to five lessons per week would be just a wee bit better off if teachers knew to how to use the right kind of monolingual as well as bilingual techniques. Let me end by quoting from the epilogue of our book, The Bilingual Reform, uh, uh, and this epilogue is called Capitalizing on, the pri on a Priceless Legacy. And this priceless legacy is our mother tongue. And foreign language teachers must make it their ally 
and not just ignore it or consider it as, as a sort of an enemy which intrudes, an intruder. Yeah? Well, it is an intruder in some cases, of course. So, here are our concluding lines. Believe in the power of teaching. Experience the excitement of teaching. Teach with mother tongue support. Teach with the wind beneath your wings. Thank you very much for listening.